Tuesday, August 15th, 2017. You are listening to Inception Radio Network, voice of the fringe majority. This is Carol Carl with UFO Headline News. Tonight's sky-watching forecast from EarthSky.org is actually for pre-dawn hours tomorrow. So who's bringing the coffee? Tomorrow, well, August 16th, 2017, in the pre-dawn hours, people around the world will see the moon shining quite close to Aldebaran, the brightest star in the constellation Taurus the Bull. You'll also see the constellation Orion the Hunter near the eastern horizon shortly before dawn's first light. The moon will be there to show you Aldebaran this week, but note that Orion's belt also points to this star. That's how you can find it after the moon has left this part of the sky. Taking its pesky moonlight with it, we might add, if you were at just the right spot on Earth on the morning of August 16th, The Caribbean, the northeastern tip of South America and North Atlantic Ocean, you could watch the waning moon occult or cover over the star Aldebaran in the wee hours of the morning, August 16th. Even though most of the world won't see this occultation, the moon and Aldebaran will still be close together on that morning. Given clear skies, the moon and Aldebaran should be yours to behold. As always, EarthSky provides plenty of graphs, maps, and charts for your consultation. Every place within a solid white line shown on one of these charts, well, that's where people will be in a position to observe the lunar occultation of Aldebaran in that pre-dawn sky. It seems that this month's occultation of Aldebaran is part of a series of 49 monthly occultations of this star by the moon. The first occultation of this series started January 29th, 2015. And the final occultation, that will conclude September 23rd, 2018. But no matter where you live worldwide, look for the moon to shine in the vicinity of the star Aldebaran during the pre-dawn hours tomorrow, August 16th. Bottom line, if you're a night owl or an early bird, Watch the moon pass in front of the constellation Taurus the Bull over the next few days. Here's a rather exciting headline from Earth Sky as well, with a byline for Eddie Irizarry. He writes there, Astronomy Essentials, and here's what he writes. Named for Florence Nightingale, asteroid 3122 Florence is the biggest near-Earth object to pass this close to Earth since this category of objects was discovered over a century ago, and it might be visible with binoculars. So grab them off the shelf, dust them off, and take a look. The next attraction coming up in our skies after the spectacular total solar eclipse of August 21st might be an asteroid big enough to be seen in small telescopes and maybe even those binoculars. It'll be appearing as a small, very slow-moving star. Asteroid 1981 ET3, also known as 3122 Florence, is a huge space rock at least 2.7 miles or 4.35 kilometers in diameter. According to Paul Chodas at the Center for Near-Earth Object Studies, quote, Florence is the largest asteroid to pass this close to our planet since the first near-Earth asteroid was discovered over a century ago. End quote. Yep, asteroid 3122 Florence will safely pass by our planet September 1st, 2017, at over 18 times the Earth-Moon distance. The asteroid will not be visible to the unaided eye, It will, however, become visible in small amateur telescopes by late August, in the course of what will become the closest encounter to Earth by this asteroid since 1890. And it says right here, it won't come this close again until after the year 2500. And not to worry, but of course this part, among the near-Earth asteroids classified as potentially hazardous, Florence is one of the biggest. Biggest asteroids include 1999JM8, it's 4.3 miles or 7 kilometers, 4183 Kuno, that's 3.5 miles or 5.6 kilometers, and last but not least, 3200 Phaeton, that's 3.2 miles or 5.1 kilometers, which is thought to be the parent body of the Geminid meteor shower. 
Of these, however, Florence is brightest, making it an excellent target for possible glimpses via small telescopes and binoculars. Its size is about half the elevation of Mount Everest, and that should allow it to reach a visual magnitude of plus 8.75 to plus 9, making it a relatively easy target for experienced observers at sites with dark skies. Astronomers will study the flyby of the huge asteroid, and radar observations are also scheduled from NASA's Goldstone Radar between August 29th to September 8th this year. The Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico will also analyze Florence from September 2nd to the 5th, 2017. Paul Chodas of the Center of NEO Studies also said, quote, The September 1st flyby of Florence will provide astronomers with an excellent opportunity to make detailed measurements of a large near-Earth asteroid. In particular, Radar scientists expect to obtain high-resolution images of Florence that could reveal surface features as small as 10 meters, 30 feet, end quotes. The asteroid rotates in about 2.5 hours, and radar observations may reveal whether Florence is a close or contact binary, or even whether the space rock has its own small orbiting moon. The closest approach to Earth is expected to occur about 8.06 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, September 1st, 2017. But backyard observers using a telescope can try to get a glimpse of the space rock a few nights before that date. On the night of August 27th, the asteroid will be in the constellation of Piscis Austrinus, reaching about 19 degrees above the southern horizon, if you're viewing from central United States. Late in the night of August 29th, the space rock will move into Capricornus and reaches an elevation of 33 degrees, as seen from, for instance, the state of Kansas in the United States. Its distance will make it difficult to detect its slow motion across the stars unless you're using at least a 5-inch diameter or bigger telescope and looking in the right direction. Although asteroid Florence is traveling at 30,266 miles per hour, 48,708 kilometers per hour, the distance will make it appear so slow that observers should keep watching the fairly bright asteroid for about 5 to 10 minutes to detect its movement across the stars. Florence, by the way, was discovered March 2, 1981, they watched it to begin with from the Sighting Spring Observatory in Australia. Its name is in honor of Florence Nightingale, 1820-1910, the founder of modern nursing. It won't be just folks down here on Earth watching for that solar eclipse, that total solar eclipse. The space station crew will get three shots at the solar eclipse. That's the headline. We grabbed it from that mainstream stalwart cbsnews.com. Well, let's read something about the man who wrote it, William Harwood, just for a second. Bill Harwood has been covering the United States space program full-time since 1984. First as Cape Canaveral Bureau Chief for United Press International and now as a consultant for CBS News. He covered 129 space shuttle missions every interplanetary flight since Voyager 2's flyby of Neptune, and scores of commercial and military launches. Based at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, Bill Harwood is a devoted amateur astronomer. He's co-author of a book called Calm Check, The Final Flight of Shuttle Columbia. So here's his story. Again, the headline, Space Station Crew to Get Three Shots at Solar Eclipse, the International Space Station's crew will enjoy views of the August 21st solar eclipse during three successive orbits, giving the astronauts a unique opportunity to take in the celestial show from 250 miles up as the moon's shadow races across from the Pacific Ocean and the continental United States before moving out over the Atlantic. Quote, because we're going around the Earth every 90 minutes, about the time it takes the sun to cross the United States, we'll get to see it three times, end quotes. That's from Randy Bresnik, what he said Friday during a NASA Facebook session. He continues, quote, The first time will be just off the West Coast. We'll actually cross the path of the sun, and we'll have a partial eclipse looking up from the space station, end quotes. For the station crew, the first partial eclipse opportunity will begin at 12.33 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time and end 13 minutes later. 
Floating in the European Columbus Laboratory module, Randy Bresnik showed off a solar filter shipped up to the station earlier, saying, quote, We've got specially equipped cameras that will have these solar filters on them to allow us to take pictures of the sun. That's going to be pretty neat. We'll have a couple of us shooting that, end quotes. One orbit later, the station will cross the path of the eclipse in the extreme northwest, following a trajectory that will carry the lab over central Canada on the way to the North Atlantic. From the space station's perspective, 44% of the sun will be blocked in a partial eclipse, but the crew will be able to see the Umbra, where the eclipse is total near the southern horizon. Quote, we'll be north of Lake Huron in Canada, then we'll be able to see the Umbra, or that shadow of the eclipse, actually on the Earth, right around the Tennessee-Kentucky area, the western side of both of those states, end quote, said Bresnik. He continued, quote, that'll be an opportunity for us to take video and take still pictures and kind of show you from the human perspective what it's going to look like, end quotes. The umbra, defining the 70-mile-wide shadow where the sun's disk will be completely blocked out, will be at its closest to the space station at 2.23 p.m. The moon's shadow will be about 1,100 miles away from the lab complex, but from their perch 250 miles up, the astronauts should be able to photograph that dark patch as they race along in their orbit. Quote, and then the third pass is actually just off the east coast, end quotes, Andy Bresnik said. He said, quote, we'll come around one more time, and from the station side, we'll see about an 85% eclipse of the sun looking up. That should be about 4.17 p.m. So we should be able to get really neat photos with our filters of the sun being occluded by the moon, end quotes. NASA plans to provide four hours of eclipse coverage starting at noon Eastern Daylight Time on the agency's satellite television channel in web streams and via ye old social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, etc. Bresnik said, quote, We have a lot of options to share all this. It's United States taxpayers' dollars. You're paying us to take these pictures, and they go to you. They're free to everybody, and you can access them from the NASA website. Oh, yes, you can, and we'll put up links here at UFO Headline News for all those appropriate sites. Speaking of sites, well, how about some sightings? Let's head on over to ufostalker.com, that great repository of sightings. We'll start in Bristol, England, in the United Kingdom. That's the setting for MUFON sighting number 85844. The date of this sighting is August 2nd, 2017. It was reported August 11th, 2017. There is photographic evidence submitted with this one, gentle listeners, so you can check that out later for your own perusal. Do your own analysis. You can find a link at ufoheadlinenews.com. Under sighting-specifics categories, our witness reports a viewing distance of 101 to 500 feet initially, and then moving out to 501 feet and eventually one mile. The altitude was over 500 feet underneath a cloud cover. Sighting duration, six minutes. Object features, none. Object flight path, straight line path. And this object was shaped like a cylinder. Here's the report. It's somewhat vague. It seems to involve two individuals. I was looking around for an object in my friend's family member's home, and he saw this UFO speeding past outside the window. So he rushed to get his phone and snapped the two pictures attached in the post. I noticed the object when its bright light caught my eyes. The object was flying at a medium to high pace across the sky, allowing me enough time to capture it with my phone's camera. I lost sight of the object once it had flown behind some trees, and no one saw it afterwards. It disappeared behind those trees. Sometimes it does manifest a little bit like hide-and-seek, no? It's not too much of a trek. Let's go to Glasgow, Scotland, shall we? That's where MUFON case number 85801 happened. The date of the event and the sighting report date, the same date, August 10th, 2017. In summary, three diamond-shaped clusters, lights close to each other, hovered, moved off. 
Sighting specifics offer a viewing distance, in this case, 501 feet to 1 mile. The altitude was over 500 feet, and there was cloud cover. The sighting duration was 7 minutes, but in sp Riding a motorcycle isn't just about what you ride, how you look, or your destination. It's about freedom and adventure. Once you start, it becomes a part of who you are. It gets in your blood. But a word of caution. If you dilute your blood with alcohol and get on your bike, well, you've lost it. Because that's not riding. That's just being stupid. Alcohol slows your reflexes and coordination. And police notice these things. So remember why you ride. Because if you don't ride sober, you will get pulled over. In spite of that time, the object features simply get that report of unknown. The object flight path was hovering and then path, and then a straight line path, then a path with directional change. This object shape? Diamond. Settle back, it's a long account. At 12.40 a.m., I went out to my balcony to have a final cigarette before bed. It was a clear, cloudless night, and as I looked at the sky, I noticed what I initially thought was a plane. I realized it was moving, but hovering at the same time, in the same place. It was then that I also realized there was no sound whatsoever coming from it. This made me look at it more closely, as I wasn't sure what this was. This is when I could see that it actually consisted of four lights forming the shape of a diamond. The top light and the one diagonally beneath it were white. The other light diagonally beneath and the bottom light, those were both red. I knew this wasn't a plane or a helicopter because of the unusual formation of those lights and the lack of sound. I watched as the cluster of lights, which were slowly flashing, slowly and silently began to move in a straight line in a northerly direction. As my balcony faces south, it slowly moved out of my line of vision. As I looked back to where I had originally spotted this hovering in the sky, I was amazed to see yet another set of four lights hovering in the exact spot I had just seen the previous lights hovering. Again, four lights forming the shape of a diamond, but this time all four lights were red and weren't flashing. I was stunned to see another set of four lights appeared from what looked like roughly 50 feet away from the red hovering lights. This third set of lights now were exactly the same as the first set of lights, which now had left my line of vision. A diamond formation, two white, two red, and flashing slowly. This formation appeared to come out of thin air, as I had never seen it when I noticed the four red hovering lights. So this whole new set of lights I had noticed were now moving in the same slow manner as the original lights. And then they began to hover and slowly move, as if they were following lights close by. As I began to follow these lights following the lights, two of the red lights changed to white, so now it had the same appearance as the original two objects, or crafts, or whatever these things were. At this point, my heart rate was increasing, as I knew I was witnessing something highly unusual. I ran into my bedroom to get my girlfriend, who had just gone to bed, to come out to the balcony and see what I was witnessing. I half expected them all the lights to have gone when we came back out, but they were both there, and still moving very slowly. We both watched as the set of lights which seemed to be getting followed changed direction from north to south, almost as though it was circling behind the other set of lights. We watched it as it slowly circled around, and I'm unsure about this part, whether it was because it was now facing us at a different angle, but its four lights were now white, and suddenly two of those lights became brighter, almost like searchlights, like helicopter searchlights. It wasn't a helicopter, though, as these two bright lights didn't give off any sort of beam the way a helicopter searchlight would. This was all done in complete silence. They then seemed to be carrying on with that northerly direction that the first set of lights took, and they seemed to fade in front of our eyes until they simply looked like a single point of white light. As we watched this, 
I then saw what I can only describe as a white flash. It came flying down towards the trees just around our house. It came in at a 45 degree angle. It had a white trail of light behind it. As it got close enough to the tree where it looked like it might hit that tree, it completely vanished. It also made no sound whatsoever. At this point, my excitement turned slightly to anxiety, as I was witnessing not only what appeared to be three UFOs, but now they seemed they were firing something from their craft. I don't know if this was some sort of flare, laser, or something else, but I'm certain that it came from the original set of lights I saw, the ones that had disappeared from our view. This was one of the most exciting and scary things I've ever seen. It leaves me in no doubt that we are definitely not alone. Interesting, that changing set of emotions from excitement to something close to anxiety. It's that unknown quotient. Let's cross a lot of water now and hover over the city of O'Fallon, state of Missouri, in the United States. Move on case number 85765. The date of this event is 8-8-2017. It was submitted 8-9-2017. Summary. Stationary, white, pulsating light. Bright. Looked like a star, but moving. Viewing distance here is over a mile. The altitude is unknown. The sighting duration was 20 minutes. Well, you guessed it, the object features, in spite of that nice chunk of time, they're simply listed as unknown. The object flight path, hovering, then path, and then path with directional change, and then path with more hovering. And the shape of this object is reported to have been star-like. Weather-wise, over O'Fallon, Missouri, the maximum temperature, 84 degrees Fahrenheit, 29 degrees Celsius. Minimum temperature, 57 degrees Fahrenheit, 14 degrees Celsius. Nothing extraordinary about the visibility factors. The maximum visibility, 10 miles, 16 kilometers. And there isn't any minimum listed because it was rather foggy. Here's what happened. I put out my dogs at around 9.30 p.m. If the night is clear, I look up at the evening sky. This night, my attention was drawn to a white flash of light to my right. At first, I thought it might have been a blinking star, airplane lights, helicopter. It was none of these. I kept focused on the spot of the sky where I saw the light. Around 10 seconds later, it flashed again. The best description I can give, it was like someone turning on a flashlight in the sky, then turning it off. It was that bright. And it repeated itself around 15 seconds later, same spot, no movement. I usually go outside with a flashlight to make sure my dogs don't stray too far away, so I decided to flash it with my flashlight. When I did, it immediately responded. I did this a number of times, and each time it responded. To test my assumption, I stopped flashing, signaling with my flashlight, it would not respond at that point, but it would then flash every 15 to 20 seconds on its own. And I should point out it made no sound. I had a strong sense this object was really high in the sky. To further test my conclusions, I asked my wife to come outside and see what I was seeing. She was surprised to see that every time I would signal with my flashlight, this object would reply, to the point where it made her nervous. She asked me to stop. I should also point out the object was stationary during this event and not visible to the eye. You could only sense its shape when it flashed that white light. The size of this, by the way, was bigger than the biggest star in the sky. My guess, four or five times bigger. This object was clearly very high in the sky since I could see aircraft fly beneath it. Between the flashes near the end of the event, I could tell that this object had changed position in the sky. Between flashes, it was moving east but very slowly. And then it disappeared. It stopped flashing. This event lasted roughly 20 minutes. Unfortunately, by the time I decided to take video with my phone, the object had left. Oh, classic.
Sometimes one's brain is trying to wrap around what the eyes are seeing and conveying. That moment of, oh, I got to get my camera just goes. Well, we've got to go because that's a wrap. Thank you for listening to Inception Radio Network. Follow today's broadcast at ufoheadlinenews.com, iHeartRadio, YouTube. Take care of each other. We're all in this together. This is Carol Carl. See you tomorrow.